My wife, uh, Peggy, is down uh, visiting with her mom in Bradenton today. Her mom's health is not uh, very good, and so Peggy has been having to spend a lot of time uh, down helping her. And I know she would love to be here because she probably thinks that you're concerned that I'm going to be on Dateline again. And so, but she is alive and well, uh, but wants you to know that uh, she misses being here with you, but really needs to be with her mom in these days. But there's one thing about Peggy that you probably don't know, and that is that my wife is an avid quilter. She loves to quilt. So buying presents for Peggy has always been pretty easy. I just find out what her favorite quilt store is at that particular time, and I just go and get her a gift certificate to it. And the kids know this as well, and so they'll get her certificates. I remember one Christmas season. It was particularly uh, hard. I mean, there were so many activities that took place in the church that I was serving, uh, all kinds of uh, gatherings, Christmas parties. Uh, our, our choir, I think, did four evenings of a musical presentation, of which I was the narrator. And there were all these services. We had a Chris, Christmas, uh, four Christmas Eve services, the last one ending at midnight. And so by the time I got home on Christmas Day, which was at like 1 o'clock in the morning, I was dead. I mean, I was just completely washed out. And there, were, there have been some Christmas seasons where when it's all over with, I end up getting sick because there's just so much effort and energy expended during that time of year. Well, it was one of those really tough uh, Christmas seasons. And, uh, but on Christmas Day, you know, Peggy got all of these gift cards, gift certificates to her favorite quilt store. And suddenly, she was rejuvenated. And so she wanted to go to the quilt store the very next day. And I'm thinking to myself, oh man, how am I going to make this? Because I have to go and carry the bags. <laughs> and yes, gentlemen, even the purse at times. And so, I, you know, and I, I can really keep up with her. I'm, I'm pretty good at shopping, except when she goes to the quilt store. Because there are th this rainbow of fabrics in these bolts of material, and she has to take almost each one out and look at it and feel the fabric, you know, and, and it, it becomes quite a long process, and she had so much money, <laughs> she had so much money to spend, it took two hours in that quilt store. You talk about a loving husband, I deserved a medal <laughs> that day, two hours. And, you know, here I am, I'm chirping these, these bags. He's got two bags full, and I was under orders, don't you dare put those bags down. And I was so tired, and, and this is really key for you to understand what was about to happen. I was so tired from all that I had been through the Christmas holidays that I wasn't focused. I just wasn't very focused. And, or, or paying much attention, really. And I, so I wanted to find a place to sit, you know. I was looking for the husband chair. And, and generally, they, in the quilt stores, they do have a number of these chairs for the poor husbands that go with their wives to shop, which is a very wise investment on their part because that means the women can shop longer. And so uh, I was looking for the husband chair, but I think every woman in that county had gotten gift certificates from that quilt store because every chair was filled with a waiting husband. So there was no husband chair. And here I am, I'm carrying these bags of material that she's already purchased, but she had more money, and so she's added again, and I'm worn out. 
So I'm looking for a place where maybe I could just lean against these bolts of material and just kind of lean back and relax a little bit. And maybe that would be enough to give me some rest. And they had their quilt fabric displayed out. It wasn't just in the bolts of material. I mean, it was laid out beautifully in all kinds of different displays. And I saw over in a corner uh, this black material that was draped out, and I thought, boy, this would be a great place for me just to go and lean and wait, holding on to these bags that I dare not put down. And so I went over there, not paying attention, not focused, and so I leaned back on this bolt of material, and I thought, oh, man, this is comfortable. This is, this is like sitting in a chair. When all of a sudden, that bolt of material moved. I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, is this thing moving? Maybe it's not very secure. And so I got up, and there I was, face to face, with an elderly Roman Catholic nun <laughs> in her black habit. And I'm, now remember, I just wasn't focused, obviously. And, and, and I, start, I, I start stammering. I, I didn't know what to say. I was so embarrassed. And, and then I said, the worst thing possible, I said, I thought you were a bolt of uh, black material, <laughs> which was absolutely the worst thing I could have possibly have said. And, and I just kept stammering. Finally, I said, I'm sorry. And this sweet lady, she kind of tweaked my cheek. And she said, don't worry, my son, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> and she walked away. Now, the moral to this story can be summed up in a pun. Those who look before they lean need not worry none. <laughs> but seriously... It really, this is really something we need to, to hear. We need to be really careful what we lean on in life, where we sort of put our weight in life, or where we put our trust in life. We need to hear this because there are all kinds of incessant voices out there asking for our trust, our allegiance, our resources, our commitment, the weight of our influence. You can't, you can't hardly take any steps out without these loud voices or these whispers of temptation saying, trust me, believe in me, give me your allegiance. You can count on me. You can put your weight on me. Money says that. Military might says that. Drugs and alcohol says that. Material things says that. Just trust me. Just commit yourself to me. You can lean your weight upon me. And this is kind of what you know, this scripture lesson is about today from uh, Joshua and Joshua 24. We hear Joshua loudly proclaiming. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to trust God is what Joshua was saying. So what's the context of this passage? What's behind this statement by, by Joshua? It sounds, this is one of the most powerful statements in the entire Bible. Choose this day whom you will serve. You can hear the power in it, but also the exasperation that Joshua must have felt as well. Because what was going on was that the people of Israel, the children of Israel, once they got out of Egypt, led by Moses, after years and years of, of slavery, 
They're wandering in the wilderness for 40 years for a generation to die off. And now there's a new generation, and Joshua is chosen to take them across the Jordan River into the promised land, this land that God said that he was going to give them, the land they dreamed about, the land flowing with milk and honey. But when Joshua leads them across the river, lo and behold, there are other people who are living in that land. And this other people, they had their own gods. They had gods of war. They had gods of wine. They had gods of fertility. And the children of Israel were a little bit tempted here. And so they began to believe in and and to worship these gods, these different gods that these pagans had. And so finally, Joshua has had enough of it. And this is what he says, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the same choice, my beloved, is ours today. Choose this day whom you will serve. Are you going to choose the false gods out here who try to entice you and tempt you with things that never bring fulfillment to life? Or are you going to choose the God who has promised to be with us through every step of life, the God who promises us the strength that we need to be able to live and to live fully and abundantly. Where are you going to lean your weight? What are the choices that you are going to make? On this Mother's Day, I want to start by saying we need to lean our weight on the family, on the family. It was important for Joshua, he says, as for me and my house, as for me and my family, we're going to choose the Lord. It reminds us of the importance of loyalty in the family. And we see this in two of the Ten Commandments. In the Fifth Commandment, it says, honor your father and your mother. And in the Seventh Commandment, it says, honor your marriage. And so this loyalty is important because a strong family produces a strong and virtuous nation. But a weak family produces a weak nation. And my beloved, how we need to to reaffirm these commandments in, in our time because family life is really beginning to wear thin. It's beginning to break down. It's breaking down all over. And a lot of the problems that we face in our culture today are the results of this breakdown within the family unit. Homelessness, sexual promiscuity, violence, abuse, public profanity, emotional illness, crimes. This is a list of social ills that are mostly caused by the breakup of the family. You go to the prisons or to the jails and you talk to the prisoners. And nine out of ten of them will tell you that their troubles began because they came from abusive homes or broken homes or difficult homes. Put over against that this. Some years back, I did the funeral of a fellow, I I say he was a young fellow compared to how old I am now. He was 55 years old, too young for me to be doing his funeral. He left a beautiful wife and three loving children. And when I met with the children, I asked them, I said, when you think about your father, what do you think about? What comes to mind? I want you to hear what they said. He always saw the good, his joy of life, his sense of humor, his commitment to Christ, his love of the Bible, his love of the church, his service to the community, 
his love for our mom, his unconditional love for us. And then they shared with me what I call three quotable quotes. They said, his love for us as the children was the perfect example of God's love. Second, he treated a federal judge and the parking lot attendant exactly the same. And then, he was the perfect example of what a Christian should be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when you came to the end of your days, your family would say something like this about you? And when I thought about it, I thought this is so important, so amazing, because it reminded me again that the home is where we receive our instruction in virtues. It is where we are taught right and wrong. It is our first brush of unconditional love, and it is where we are taught about faithfulness. The point is clear. Strong families build a strong and virtuous nation. And so we shouldn't be following the fads of the day, but instead we should be focusing ourselves and leaning upon the values of good, solid Christian homes. And then second, we need to lean upon the church. And I put these, these two together for a, a reason. Because we know that there are, are children and young people, young adults, who do not, don't always have the experience of a good home. They don't have the loving parents that, that they should have. They, there's brokenness in their families. And if that's the case, then the church needs to step up. The church needs to be that source of, of guidance and love and unconditional grace. It needs to be the place where there's supervision and some direction and even some discipline for the children. There was a young man who was a part of my congregation years ago, and he came from a really bad home situation. His father had deserted the family, hadn't uh, been around for eight years. Hadn't even showed his face. Hadn't heard from him. The mother was such a, such a faithful mother. She had to work, though, two minimum wage jobs, one in the morning and, or one in the day, one in the evening, in order just to make ends meet, which meant that she was never home. And so this young man adopted the church, and the church adopted him. Whenever the church doors were open, he'd be there. And the church would embrace him. They loved him. Sometimes we fed him. We had men in the group who mentored him, took him to ball games, took him fishing. He was instructed. He was a part of the youth program. He was nurtured in that as well. And this young man grew up to be one of the finest Christian young men you'd ever want to meet because the church was there to be what he lacked at home. It's the, uh, Kim Medina, in his song about the church, put it this way. If this is not a place where you'll accept me as I am, where do I go to be? If this is not a place where I can try and learn and grow, where can I just be me? If this is not a place where my tears are understood, where do I go to cry? If this is not a place where my spirits can take wing, where do I go to fly? Be careful. Be careful what you lean on, where you put your weight in life. 
where you put your trust. But my beloved, I tell you, you can trust the church. And you can trust the values of a good, solid, moral Christian home. And then finally, we need to lean our weight on God, which is, you know, this is what faith is about. Faith is about leaning on God. It's about trusting God and knowing that this is a God who's going to be with us through the good, the bad, and the ugly in life and still embrace us unconditionally with his love in the good and the bad. There was this young girl who, um, she cut her eyelid and she cut it really, really bad. And it was cut so bad that the doctor took one look at it and knew she was going to have to have stitches. But he also knew that this was such a sensitive area that he dare not try to put any anesthesia there. And so he spoke to the little girl and told her what he was going to have to do. He says, now, I'm going to have to, to put a stitch in your eyelid and I need to know, can you be very, very still when you feel the pressure of the needle because I can't have you move? And she said, I think I can if I can sit in my daddy's lap while you do it. And so the father lifted her up and put her in his lap and he embraced her with his arms. He put her head, leaned it up against his shoulder. And the doctor very skillfully and quickly put that stitch. And she didn't even flinch because she was in the arms of her father. That's a parable. And it's a graphic reminder that in life we can always trust and count on the loving embrace of a God who cares. A God whose weight we can lean on. A God that we can lean on the everlasting arms. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers present. Let's bow in prayer.